when the Buddha got on the right path, he went straight from right resolve to right effort and then to right concentration. But when he explained the path, he put some steps in between. Right speech, right action, right livelihood. The question is why? It may have been because he saw that if you're going to practice right resolve, you first have to start with your outside actions. If you resolve on renunciation but then are actually engaging in sensuality, or if you resolve on non ill will but you're actually mistreating other beings, there's something wrong. If you can't even control your actions, how are you going to control your thoughts? Last night we talked about right speech, but the two other factors in between, right action and right livelihood, are directly related to right resolve and also directly related to the practice of right concentration. If you resolve on renunciation, you're not going to be engaging in illicit sex. If you resolve on non-ill will, you're not going to be engaged in killing or stealing. So it's a test. Is your resolve honest? Is it in earnest? And then as you follow through with that, with that resolve in your actions, you develop some good qualities you're going to need to get the mind into concentration. You have to keep the principles of right resolve in mind. That's mindfulness. And you have to keep watch over your actions. Do they actually follow in with right resolve? That's alertness. And then the effort you make to actually follow the principles of right resolve. That's ardency, which translates into right effort. Remembering, as the Buddha said, that there are actually three factors that circle around every other factor in the path. Right view, right mindfulness, right effort. So you're getting beginning practice in right mindfulness and right effort as you follow through with the principles of right action. And at the same time, you're learning how to focus on your intentions, because this is what makes the difference between following a precept and not following it. In other words, if you kill something inadvertently, it doesn't break the precept. <clears throat> if you take something not knowing that it's not yours, it doesn't break the precept. If someone forces you to have sex against your will, it doesn't break the precept. So you're learning to look more and more at your intention, because after all, that's what concentration is. It's a firm intention, and you are learning how to keep watch over your mind, to be honest with yourself about what your intentions are. The same principle applies to right livelihood. In the definition of the path, it's given in very general terms. In fact, of all the factors, it's the one that's the biggest. You abandon wrong livelihood and you follow right livelihood. But there are other places in the canon where the Buddha points out that some occupations are outside of the pale. Selling weapons, selling intoxicants, selling poison, selling meat. Selling living beings, which could include selling people to be slaves, or selling animals that are going to be killed. You might wonder why the Buddha had to add right livelihood when right action would seem to go against all these things. It's so because of the way we earn our livelihood, where we look for happiness, is an area where we tend to be blind to whatever harm we're doing, because our 
we feel that our life depends on it. We don't want to hear about ways in which our livelihood is harmful. This is why when the Buddha was asked about different occupations, a soldier came to him one time and said he had been trained that if he died in battle, he would go to the heaven of heroes. What did the Buddha have to say about that? The Buddha wouldn't answer right away. But the soldier was, was sincere. He wanted to know. So he asked a second time and a third time. When you ask something in those days and three times, it showed that you really wanted to know the answer. And so the Buddha said, well, okay, if you're in the midst of battle, killing other living beings, thinking about may they be destroyed, your mind is filled with their will. If you die at that point, it's not going to go to a good place. It's going to go to, not to the heaven of heroes, but to the hell of warriors, of those who died in battle. The soldier burst out into tears, and the Buddha said, See, that's why I didn't want to answer. And the soldier said, Well, that's not why I'm crying. I'm crying because I was lied to by my teachers. There's a similar suit where an actor comes and wants to know, Is it true that he's going to go to the heaven of laughter? Again, the Buddha says, Don't ask. The actor asks three times. And finally, the Buddha says, Okay, if you're trying to give rise to passion, aversion, and delusion in your audience and in your, in your own mind, when you die you go to the hell of laughter. In other words, not where they're laughing with you, but they're laughing at you. And again, the actor bursts out into tears for the same reason. It shows that this is a really sensitive issue, where we look for our happiness, where we look to maintain our lives. Because after all, we are beings. We've chosen to become beings by latching on to the different aggregates. And that requires feeding. We feel that our very identity depends on feeding. This is something that all beings have in common. This is the answer to that question, what is one in the Buddhist catechism? All beings subsist on nutriment. We're all around their feeding. So if you really want to be sincere in following with the principles of right resolve, you have to look very carefully at your occupation. And make sure that it follows in line with the principles of right resolve. And as you follow it, both right action and right resolve, it develops an attitude in the mind. They can be taken inward as you're practicing concentration. For example, the principle against killing. What kills your good qualities in the mind? In other words, heedlessness. Heedlessness, he said, is a path to death. So you can take that as a warning as you're getting the mind into concentration. Don't be heedless of the little thoughts that come in and say, now that you've got this hour here, we can actually think about something else. There's something I've been wanting to think about for a long time, and here's a nice empty space. And there'll be a voice that says, it doesn't matter, just for a few minutes. But a few minutes turns into a lot of minutes, or it turns into another topic entirely. And these thoughts nibble away at your concentration until there's nothing left. So when you think about the precept against killing, think about being heedful in your meditation. Similarly with the precept against stealing. Don't go thinking about the bad points of other people. And John Lee says you're stealing their, their bad points. You haven't asked permission to take them and think about them. And there's no real meat there. Because often when you're thinking about their bad points, you can think about well, how they deserve to be Punishers deserve to suffer in this way or that way. It turns into ill will, which is one of the major hindrances. And of course, the precept against illicit sex. Any sensual thoughts that come up in the course of the meditation, you've got to put them aside. And there's part of the mind that says, here's a chance to have a little fun. Have a little entertainment. 
then again, you've got to realize that that kind of thing pulls you out of concentration. You may be very focused on some of those sensual thoughts, but it's wrong concentration. You're trying to provide a, a, the mind with a better source of happiness. Because after all, the way you think is going to bend your mind, and when your mind is bent, it's going to bend your actions. So don't think that when you're sitting here meditating that you're in a karma-free zone where your thoughts have no consequences. They bend the mind, and they can bend it crooked if you're not careful. Similarly with the principle of right livelihood, as John Lee talks about the livelihood of the mind. In other words, where you look for your happiness. So are you going to continue looking for happiness in areas that cause harm to other beings, harm to yourself? Or are you going to look for happiness just being here with a breath? The Buddha himself compares right concentration to food. Each of the levels of jhana corresponds to an increasingly more and more refined and nourishing food. So you finally get to the, the fourth jhana where you've got honey and ghee and butter. And so for the livelihood of the mind, for the strength of the mind, this is where you want to look. Getting the mind centered. Learning how to relate to the body in a way where you feel at home with the body, at home with the breath. You feel nourished and well supported. And this is your livelihood. So these are some of the ways in which the practice of right action and right livelihood helps carry over from right resolve into the practice of right concentration. Gives you some practice in the quality of ardency, the right effort. The factors that you need for right mindfulness. And it creates the proper environment. When you live adhering to these principles, you create peace around you. And as you create peace, you can sit down. And there are no regrets in the mind. This, the Buddha said, is probably the most direct way in which following the precepts leads to concentration. There's a sense of no regret. You haven't done anything to harm anybody. There's no wounds in the mind. Because if you've harmed somebody or harmed yourself, it can either be the type of wound that's open and raw. Or it can be one where a lot of scar tissue has developed around it. In other words, you're in hard denial. And neither kind of wound is going to be conducive to the kind of concentration where you can really see things clearly. Remember, as the Buddha said, concentration fostered by virtue is, has great fruit. Now, it is possible to get the mind into concentration without virtue, but the fruit is going to be spoiled. But you're practicing right concentration, remember you want a good crop of fruit, something you can feed on and maintain the livelihood of the mind. So make sure that these factors of the path are there in your practice. That they help the different fact other factors of the path come together.